The sport of parkour sees athletes jumping, climbing, and moving quickly through obstacles. To do all this, they must be able to rely on their shoes to grip surfaces, absorb impact, and most importantly, stay in one piece. Parkour specific shoes aren't widely produced, so athletes find a new shoes which happen to fit the correct profile. By looking at the shoes commonly used, we can assess what factors are important and identify what materials will make the best shoes in the future. The three most important factors are durability of the upper body, cushioning of the midsole, and the grip and durability of the outsole. All of these parts are usually made from polymers as they can be lightweight, strong, and have highly tunable properties. Common materials are nylon, blown ethylene vinyl acetate foam, and rubber. However, these names alone aren't particularly informative. For example, both cling film and vinyl records are made from PVC, yet both have very different properties. We are going to focus on the composition of the outsole. In many cases, manufacturers say their sole is made from rubber. However, in reality, the material they are using is an elastomer, the particular composition of which they would rather keep secret. Elastomer is just a general term defining a group of polymers which display rubber-like elasticity. You may already know that polymers are just long chains of individual repeating units. The reason elastomers have this elastic property can be attributed to changes in entropy. When at rest, the chains constituting a polymer are relaxed in random coils, high entropy or high disorder. As the polymer is stretched, the chains become aligned and organized so that entropy has decreased, low disorder. Since all systems naturally tend towards a high entropy or high disorder state, the polymer will return to the original relaxed state. However, it is important to know that for this to occur, the polymer must be above its glass transition temperature. This is the threshold temperature for when a polymer changes from a hard glassy state to a soft rubbery state. The most common elastomers used in the soles of sports shoes are thermoplastic polyurethanes. Being thermoplastic means that the polymer shape can be heated and reformed. A urethane bond is the combination of these two functional groups, isocyanate and hydroxyl. Therefore, in a polyurethane, the backbone is joined by many urethane bonds where the functional groups belong to separate molecules, generally referred to as diisocyanates and diols. This is very different to natural rubber, which is what you might think of when you see the rubber label on your shoes. Natural rubber is made from a single monomer called isoprene, which forms cis polyisoprene, which is found in natural latex from rubber trees or can be synthesized from petroleum. We can see that on the molecular level, these polymers look quite different. But what difference does this make to their properties? And why is polyurethane preferred? The answer comes down to strength. Natural rubber must be vulcanized to make it practical to use. At points where there's a carbon-hydrogen single bond on one chain and a carbon-carbon double bond on an adjacent chain, the double bond is broken and sulfur atoms are added between. These sulfur bridges are weaker than carbon-carbon single bonds, but actually contribute greater strength to the polymer, as the sulfur bonds can relieve stress by breaking without damaging the overall structure. Links with several sulfur atoms make the rubber more resistant to flexing and less likely to develop cracks. Less vulcanization will make the rubber more sticky but less durable. On the other hand, polyurethanes are generally stronger and have better abrasion resistance due to their unique internal structure. Firstly, if they are made from monomers with more than two functional groups, for example, a polyol is used rather than a diol, then naturally branched and cross-linked chains will form. Secondly, and more importantly, polyurethanes are made stronger due to the effects of hard and soft segments. The diisocyanate sections are hard as they contain inflexible benzene rings. The long polyol sections are soft because of the high amount of free rotation in the singularly bonded carbon backbone. The small hard sections are polar, allowing them to create pseudo-crystalline areas, that is, areas with organized structure, whereas the soft sections are nonpolar and make a surrounding flexible matrix. Therefore, the hard areas are physical crosslinks which give strength, while the soft areas allow for elongation. Both of these factors play a similar role to sulfur in natural rubber. However, they are more affected overall, making polyurethanes much more durable. To further improve the properties and decrease the price of an elastomer, a filler is usually added. The most common are carbon black and silica. When added to a polymer mix, the elastic modulus, which is the material's resistance to being deformed elastically when a stress is applied to it, can increase by up to two or three times. Along with this, they drastically improve toughness and abrasion resistance. However, increasing the proportion of filler above 30% by volume does not improve their strength further. The obvious disadvantage to adding either filler is that as the elastic modulus increases, the material loses springiness. 
If we compare the soles of two shoes I have used, one containing carbon black and the other not, we can see that the non-carbon containing sole has significantly more wear, and thus provides worse traction, as areas tend to come off rather than grip. Carbon black is the collodial form of elemental carbon, which means almost pure carbon arranged in minute particles. The size of these particles is crucial and has the biggest effect on the resulting elastomer. The size of carbon black particles usually varies from 50 to 500 nanometers. The factors which affect the amount of reinforcement are the van der Waals forces between the carbon black and the polymer, the chemical crosslinks of the polymer onto the filler surface, and the mechanical interlocking of the polymer onto the filler surface. What this looks like on the molecular level is not fully understood. However, one prevalent theory is that the area of polymer immediately around the carbon particle surface is immobilized, referred to as bound, as a result of the complex combination of the factors we have just discussed. The bound phase exhibits glassy behavior and is assumed to be bonded more strongly than other areas in the elastomer. This tells us why small particles are so vital. All of these factors suggest that the better the adhesion between the nanoparticle surfaces and the polymer gives better reinforcement. Smaller particles have higher surface area, so have more space for adhesion to occur. Moreover, smaller particles are also less likely to agglomerate, or stick together, which means more of the surface is available for filler polymer interactions. This structure resists damage from abrasion in two ways. Just as in vulcanized polyisoprene, there are strong bonds and weak bonds within the filled elastomer. Under stress, the weak linkages, such as van der Waals, represented here by the hashed lines, will break, which dissipates the energy without damaging the strong linkages and overall structure. Slippage at the filler polymer interface also redistributes stress. In this diagram, the lines represent the polymer chain and the circles represent the filler. Once the shortest chain is under tension, the strain can be released as heat energy through friction when the molecules slide, preventing them from breaking. Overall, there are many factors to consider when designing the perfect material for any function. In this case, the chemist developing the best rubber compound must carefully consider what to alter in order to reach a good balance. For example, more filler will increase the abrasion resistance but decrease the flexibility, whereas longer soft sections in the polyurethane chain will make the rubber more elastic but less strong. It is most likely that further advances in this technology will not be due to huge breakthroughs, but because of continued understanding and refinement of current ideas.